Anybody hear that? I'm fairly alarmed here. Welcome back to the Knights of Christendom. I'm your host, Frank. I'm joined here with my good partner, Neil, who's back from a little time off. How you doing, Neil, buddy? I'm doing okay, getting by. Great, great. It's great to have you back. Great to hear your voice. And uh, I'm excited to do this show with you. I, th I just think, you know, me and you, when we talk a lot about the social issues, we got a lot of chemistry here. I think we knock them out the park. And, and I got one here that I want to touch on, something that touched me when I was a young man very early on. I was born and raised in L.A. I, I grew up in, in a predominantly uh, Catholic area, right, with lots of Italians and Croatians. But, you know, the, the, the great, within the greater circle of that sort of L.A. culture down there was a big presence of evangelicalism, especially down in Orange County. And it's interesting because one of the things you've always confronted with by many Protestants, and, and this is kind of pretty much all over the country now, it's, it's been around for a long time, is is that catchphrase that Protestants love to use in their attempt to evangelize, and that is, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And Neil, I was confronted by that uh, back when I was a young man, really before I understood my faith and things, and it kind of caught me off guard, even though it was always a strange comment, because oftentimes they would ask you, if you were Catholic, and and then they kind of threw that out at you to try to get you to bite, kind of they're throwing bait at you. And as a Catholic, I always thought it was a strange phrase because, well, yeah, yeah, we accept Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Savior. We're Catholics. That's what we believe. But, you know, there's something more to it. And there's something very odd and very strange. And I guess my question for you is this. Have you ever been confronted by that question? And I guess Bottom line, uh, Neil, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Uh, well, I think everybody has been confronted with that phrase in some form uh, throughout their life. I mean, it's so rampant kind of everywhere. Um, but the real question is, what does that even mean? Because it's such a vague statement. It, 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 it's so, uh, and it can be very subjective as to what it means, to, depending on who you're asking. Um, but as a Catholic, our personal relationship with Jesus Christ is not just the sinner's prayer. It's not just uh, verbal or spiritual, but rather it's incarnational as well. Uh, and we have we live out that personal relationship through the sacraments. And in the sacraments, you have not only the form, which is the prayers, but matter, you know, the, the physicality that uh, we as human beings need to have. So I think... As Catholics, we have this first relationship, but it's much deeper than what the Protestants are putting forth. Because in my experience, from when I've heard that phrase, it's very subjective and it's very emotional. Um, and it's not grounded in anything material or anything, uh, what I would say, incarnational. Um, it's just a matter of how I'm relating to Jesus in some way. Uh, so if, when I get that question, I have to ask them back, what do you mean by that? How do you mean it? Because you, if you're divorcing that personal relationship, um, if, you ha if, the, if your idea of a personal relationship is to divorce that from the church, well, then you don't have a, a, a true full relationship with Jesus Christ because you're not in communion with Jesus Christ. Yeah. See, that's interesting to me because... You know, the first thing I thought of really is, is that, you know, when you say, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as a Catholic, really our faith, it's, it's, there's a private element to it, but really the Catholic faith is more of, it's a public relation with Christ, right? We have a visible church, we have visible sacraments, we have, we have priests that represent God, and, 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 and ultimately we have that interior relationship as well, too. You know, I, I got my my beautiful tapestry here 
of the sacred heart of Jesus. And, you know, I, I communicate with Jesus as I reflect on that tapestry that I have there every day, every morning, asking for forgiveness. And so that's what I find kind of interesting, because when you talk to the Protestant, they'll throw this phrase out in an attempt to start a conversation with you, right? This evangelical attempt to get you to convert over to whatever it is. Now, of course, every Protestant denomination, especially evangelical, is different. When I was kind of young and searching, trying to search out kind of the truth in you know, in this world in regards to faith and religion, I visited a whole host of different Protestant churches. I went to a Baptist church in freaking um, South Central Los Angeles. I went to a LA Church of Christ. They're kind of weird to me. Um, where else did I go to? A couple of other ones off top of my head. And you know, it's funny because they all kind of use the same phrase, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? But at the end of the day, they're all different. They all have di different dogmas, they all have yeah. different doctrines. And what they will tell you is we have the truth. We are the ones you need to follow. It is this church that has found the true way. And, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting in the sense that it's a phrase that's, like you said, very vague, very indifferent. But within their own realms, they can't even decide what truth actually is as they all contradict one another, Neil. Yeah, and, and ultimately what they're going to probably do, I suspect, is turn to sola scriptura. Uh, right. They're going to go by the Bible alone, which is itself an error. The only time, you know, well, not, excuse me, I'm getting confused with, the, uh, with James when he talks about faith alone. But it's self-contradictory to say that there's sola scriptura to go by the scriptures alone. Because at one point there was not a scriptures to follow. There was just the verbal teachings of Jesus Christ, which we call sacred tradition. And even if you're going to turn to scripture, Jesus is going to tell you, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Well, his commandments is to follow the church that he founded on Peter. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty clear in Matthew 16. I, I think it's interesting because as you study the history of Protestantism, especially Protestantism in America, something went awfully wrong right at the beginning of the nation, right? Yeah. As I said so many times before, Neil, right when the Constitution of the United States was ratified and we got in the First Amendment, the concept of religious liberty. Now, mm -hmm. some pundits would argue, well, Religious liberty in the American Constitution is perfectly Catholic. It's, it's an act of consciousness, you know, an act of conscience, I should say, right? And it's interesting because as I study Protestantism in America, and I have a little bit, it's not the way the American people took it that you have a right to conscience. They took it almost immediately like, I can believe anything I want. I can create any religion I want. And basically, you know what? I have no ties to sacred tradition, the 2,000-year analogy of the faith, and our ancestral roots. And it immediately, as we ratify the First Amendment, you see the Mormons heading to Utah, the campfire preachers. You got George Whitfield now running through rural America in the South because the Anglican Church could not get the sacraments out into this vast rural area of America. So it became all about an inner experience within Protestantism, especially in these rural areas. And with that interior experience, you know, it really became a personalized religion. That's why when you look at Protestantism in America, it's awfully strange to me because it doesn't even relate back to Europe all that much. Sure, they got some doctrines they'll appeal to, some confessionals and things like that, but American Protestantism has turned into a feel-good religion. And then when you combine that with sort of the classical liberal ideology of overcoming suffering, how we're not supposed to believe in suffering anymore. That's kind of an old Catholic thing. What we really need here, of course, is make prosperity and make the economic engine of prosperity work. You combine that, you infuse that with some type of a feel-good internal Protestantism, Neil, and, and you create really a mess that ultimately really dissolves American culture immediately. And all these factions that begin to sort of uprise in America, it's kind of strange, it's kind of kooky, and the world has never seen the kind of fracturing within Christianity, Christianity, like we saw in Europe. It never happened, not to this degree, because religion became personalized, Neil. Yeah, and that's what this whole personal relationship with Jesus Christ really boils down to in the Protestant view, 
it becomes, well, my conscience is the ultimate arbiter of truth. Right. And how I feel about uh, scripture, how I feel about what Jesus commanded me to do. Uh, it's all about how I feel, what I think. And they're, like I said before, they're divorcing this relationship from the church that Jesus Christ founded. They're divorcing it from that hierarchy that he established. And they're saying, well, I get to decide what is what defines this personal relationship. I'm defining the parameters of the relationship. I mean, yeah. I can make my own covenant with God. You know, I can make my own promises. I can do my own thing. Um, and that's why when I hear this personal relationship stuff, why I have to ask, what do you mean by that? Because what I'm hearing is, well, I get to decide what's true. Yeah, see, and that's the thing, because like I said earlier, with, with us Catholics, we have a a personal relationship, but we also have a public relationship, right? Yeah, so it's in America, grounded in the incarnation of Christ. Yeah, yeah. And so so in America, you know, you get to John Locke, we create this idea of separation of church and state. And now the state doesn't acknowledge God anymore. It, 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 it all becomes privatized. We're in the old world. We had the state and the church that were kind of in alliance with one another or they worked together. And so there was a relationship here in a public sphere. Now we've privatized everything and, and, and the government has taken an indifferent approach. And, and through this, Protestants have internalized these ideas of their own individual conscience. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll tell you they read the Bible, but again, so scriptura is a heresy. So scriptura has led to the anarchy we have today. And I guess, you know, you know, when we look at a lot of the problems in America today, which ultimately I believe stem from Protestantism, not only the Enlightenment, but also going back to the Protestant Reformation, you see them reaching for something as society devolves, the culture devolves, the family is broken up, and they kind of keep going back to the well, which is the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. And in a desperation mode to try and save society and to save our political system, which is going off the cliff at this point in history, you've heard even classical liberals and Jews come together, start talking about, we got to get back to the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. uh, conservative talk show host Dennis Prager had this campaign, let's make the Bible the book of America again. And of course, we've talked about this before, Neil. It's not like the Bible's ever gone anywhere. The Bible has been the book of America for 250 years, but for some reason, that strategy isn't hasn't worked. And I don't know why Protestants and Jews would think at this point in history that that strategy would work now. Well, that's because the Bible is up for anyone's interpretation. There's no, once again, church to say this is what scripture means. Right. This is what this is what a relationship with Christ means. It's all about what I think, what I my own individual conscience decides, how I interpret it. And if I can get enough people to follow my own way of thinking, well then I'll have more little ministers, you know, that preach from their their church down the street, you know, about their own personal interpretation of scripture. Right. But even St. Peter says there's uh, there's no part of scripture that's a, a personal interpretation. But yet, you know, they kind of run over that part. They don't want to yeah. read that part. You know, they want to keep doing their own thing. And that's why this personal relationship stuff, it sounds good. And there's, there's a half truth there. Yeah. You do want to have a relationship with Christ. But how do you have that relationship with Christ? How do you live it out? How is it expressed? Well, without the church, you have no clue. I mean, you you read the scriptures, but then you're interpreting it the way you want to interpret it. You have no grounding. Once again, no incarnational grounding of of the of the truth. Yeah, yeah. I think what Protestants would tell you is you you, you come out and you have this emotional experience or an interior experience, I should say. You say your sinner's prayer, and thus you're saved. Now, there's a big controversy within Protestantism whether. You know, once saved, always saved. There's debates within them. They, they can't even decide what this moment of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior actually means at the end. They can't even tell you that. All they can tell you is you got to have this moment, even though they can't really define it at the end of the day. Uh, but, but you know, they would say, Neil, you say the sinner's prayer, you accept Christ into your heart. Why isn't that enough? Because we as human beings are made of spirit and flesh form and matter 
We need a physical component to this. We're not strictly spiritual beings. We have a body. And that body requires physical things. That's why our Lord gave us the sacraments. That's why we have to be born again of spirit and water. That's why we have the Eucharist. That's why we have to confess our sins. In fact, that's how we live out our personal relationship with Christ. I am baptized into the mystical body of Christ in water and spirit. I confess my sins to, my, to God. I tell him all the wrongs I've done and ask for his forgiveness in confession to a priest as his representative. I become one with him, with the Eucharist. So it's like it's these physical things that are also attached to the spirit. It's spirit and it's form and matter. It's spirit and flesh. That's why I keep saying it's incarnational because it's incarnate. It's not just a spiritual reality, but it also has a physical component to it because we as human beings are physical beings. And we right. need those things to, in order to reach God, to, to, to understand God and to, and to um, grow from glory to glory. Right, right. Yeah, and I think the emphasis within Protestantism is, is that there's this one moment in time where you have this interior thing that happens when you accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, where we Catholics would say that, you know, life is a journey. The Bible says, I believe with St. Paul, those that endure to the end. And that's what we believe, walking in love with the Lord, right? Have faith, but walking and working in love, acting out of faith, right? As the Bible says so many times that you have to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Mm -hmm. The Bible nowhere says that you are saved by faith alone. In fact, you know, the one, the one scripture verse that where faith alone actually appears says you are not saved by faith alone. I believe that's James 2.24. Uh, Neil. Mm -hmm. So so there's a ton of contradictions here. And I think what's happened here is that American Protestantism, evangelicalism has turned into sort of a feel good kind of religion, right, to overcome suffering, combine it with, again, uh, the idea of, of the American economic engine of prosperity, where it becomes a health and wealth gospel, where the way you get butts in the seats is to appeal to our sort of our natural elements, right? But in terms of comfort, the idea of suffering, of carrying your cross is very different. Maybe you carry your cross in a spiritual sense as a Protestant, but definitely you don't carry your cross in this world. That's what it seems like to me, Neil. Well, it, it just seems like it's very emotional and it goes right. to our, our, our baser instincts, our baser, uh, what's the word? Um, our, our, our lesser senses, uh, and it's just appealing to emotion, what feels good. Because as long as I can say these words and I feel okay doing whatever I do, because I said the sinner's prayer, and I have this personal relationship with Christ, so I can continue to do whatever it is I'm doing. Um, it, it might be wrong what I'm doing, and I, I probably shouldn't do those things, but my salvation isn't dependent on any of that. So it's it's kind of loosey goosey, you know. It's mm. It's not, once again, it's not incarnate. <laughs> it's it's not, it's not. Um, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's not solid. It seems very uh, simplistic. Yeah, yeah, simplistic and and sort of self motivating, self righteous kind of yeah. not self righteous, but but self serving is what I meant, um, Neil. You know, and, and that's what I don't like about it. No, to me, this is why sort of through time and space and things like that, you see the devolution of Protestant doctrines, right? Especially when it comes to a lot of the sexual mores, right? Um, 1920s, 1930s, right around there, they relent on contraception. Uh, 1960s, and we begin, they begin to relent on divorce and remarriage, while the Catholic Church is held firm on those issues. Uh, even the abortion issue, it was really Catholics that led the charge on that. It, Protestants jumped on later, but initially it was it was Catholics leading the charge on all these, really on all these social issues. I mean, even when you talk about, um, you know, a lot of the moral debauchery that we see, pornography, things like that, uh, bad TV, movies, and Hollywood, that was really the Catholics that were fighting that in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, while the mm -hmm. Protestants were trying to figure out what they believed because of all these contradictions. The other thing I find fascinating, too, is oftentimes, Neil, I talk to a Protestant who will go to a particular church, and I know many Protestants suffer from this, and they'll be at a church, and they're just not comfortable. 
they may go there because they have fellowship or they know somebody, or maybe it's the only church in town, or maybe it's the closest church that maybe reflects their beliefs, but they're always constantly questioning doctrine, right? They're always going through the, not only through the Bible, but through lexicons and, and books and, and thesauruses and whatever it is they need to siphon through all the different doctrines. And these Protestants, oftentimes, they just disagree, but there's nowhere else for them to go until the next church comes around and they feel a little bit more comfortable, but they never quite get it right. And the church hopping in Protestant America is notorious. In fact, you know, evangelicals will tell you themselves, they can't even keep butts in the seat. Something like 70% turnover rate every three years in evangelical churches, which shows you there's a great dissatisfaction about what sort of these Protestant churches teach. Now, I know as Catholics, we've had our problems, but it's a different phenomenon, right? Because for us, you know, sort of our, our hook and anchor is it feel-goodism, right? It is the Gospels. It is the church. It is the eternal tradition, sacred tradition that we've always taught through familial lines. And either you come to accept them or you don't. And most of the time, when Catholics leave the faith, it's not because necessarily it's a doctrinal problem per se or, or a contradiction or they don't like or, or they don't agree with this teaching. But it's usually because the church says no to certain things of this world, particularly to sin, while Protestants have a better opportunity to accommodate sins within the ranks. Neil. Well, when you make God only about the personal relationship and notice I use that word only. Right. When you make it only about that, well, then you have every uh, a, a right to say, well, gee, I don't agree with this minister and what he's teaching. I'll go make yeah. my own church. Because you've made it so personal that you get to decide what the truth is. And I feel like that's, I mean, that happened with Martin Luther when he rebelled from the church. You yeah. know, he broke from the altar. And now all of a sudden, there goes the foundation. There, that we in the church, in the Catholic Church, we have our doctrines and our dogmas that do not change, and it's either you accept that or you don't. But in the Protestant realm, it's well, I am free to decide what I'm going to accept, what I'm not going to accept. I can decide for myself because I've I've personalized Christ to such a degree that I am the ultimate arbiter of what's true, and yeah. my interpretation, and what I decide what's doctrine, and I can just go and make my own church. It doesn't matter, you know. So that's really the negative aspect of making Christ this, this personal relationship with Christ to the extent of divorcing the church from it, divorcing yeah. our foundation and doctrine and dogmas. Yeah, and I think it's also the byproduct of Sola Scriptura, which is flawed in every capacity. Not only is it not taught in the Bible, not only is it not taught in sacred tradition, not only was it not taught by uh, the early church fathers, uh, Christ never spoke about it. You know, it's like I, I remind my Protestant friends all the time. You know, Jesus never wrote anything down on paper. Jesus never commanded anybody to write anything down on paper. The only example we have of, of any type of Jesus sort of writing anything is where he wrote something in the sand. Remember, there was some, somebody was, um, yeah. I forget the story now. Uh, but but my point is, is that nobody ever talked about writing anything down. The gospel was was oral. The gospel was spoken. The gospel was spread through his apostles and ultimately the successors of his apostles. Now, that's not to say there's not a place for scripture, because later on, those apostles and, and those disciples gave us the scriptures, obviously. But these are some of the contradictions. And, and let me tell you, too, here's the other thing I've noticed, too, that I find very disturbing about Protestantism, especially American Protestantism. You know, I mentioned earlier, Neil, how they have this like 70, 80 percent turnover rate every three years. And why wouldn't they? Because the natural conclusion of Sola Scriptura is why do you even need a church? Why? When you got the Bible yourself. And, and I've known many Protestants that have told me that all Protestant churches are corrupt, all churches, Catholic and all Protestant. I got the Bible. I'm going to go hang out in my basement and I'm going to interpret the word of God on my own. I don't need a church. They're all corrupt. I have the truth. I found it in the Bible, Neil. And that's the anarchy that comes of Protestantism eventually. Yeah, I mean, once again, it becomes very subjective. And mm -hmm. I know I know, as individual Protestants would dispute that. But the reality is, is that any Protestant can go and make a church anywhere they want. Yeah. And claim that they have the truth. And they're just as Protestant as the other Protestant down the street. You know, it, it it's subjectivism. It's what it leads to. 
it leads to your own personal opinion, your own personal interpretation, yeah. your own conscience being the arbiter of all truth. And they forget that your conscience needs to be properly formed. And you can't you can't just say, well, my art, my conscience is going to decide everything when it's in malformed. They'll say the Bible is their conscience. Well, that's odd. What, would, what did the Christians do in the first 300 years without a Bible then? <laughs> For, actually, what did the they first do? 1600 years until the printing press was invented. Yeah, and, and then <laughs> yeah, and then mass production with the printing press. Yeah. Well, I guess they were out of luck. They didn't have a conscience. They didn't yeah. know what to do. Yeah. And, and the writings that the apostles gave us was letters. It wasn't like they compiled the Bible. They right. were writing letters to their churches because they were bishops of their diocese. <laughs> they didn't call it diocese, but that's what they were doing. They had authority to tell the Christians in those uh, different little churches how to live, what the truth was, because God, Jesus Christ ordained them to be the bishops. And that continues through the successions, through the successes of the apostles of our modern day bishops and the Pope. Right. Now, Neil, the Mormons would say <laughs> that the church went corrupt at some point in throughout salvation history had to be reestablished by Joseph Smith sometime in the 19th century by Joseph Smith, right? And and and, and sort of the more mainstream, I guess, more orthodox brand of Protestants would critique Mormons harshly, right? Because yeah. there's issues there, right? With their theology, it's well, very, a lot, very... A lot of Protestants would not continue, can, uh, would not count Mormons as Christians. Right, exactly. That's my point, because they're, they're so, they're beyond the pale of orthodoxy, let's put it that way. Yeah. But as I look at history, you know, when we stop at the 16th century with Martin Luther, you know, here are the Mormons in the 19th century arguing that the gates of hell prevailed. Do the Protestant reformers, starting with Luther and Calvin and King Henry, aren't they essentially in some ways making the same argument? E even though in the Bible, Matthew 16 says that the gates of hell will not prevail. Can we make an argument that the Protestants believed in the 16th century that the gates of hell actually prevail? Well, that was, that was exactly what I was going to say. Jesus Christ is a liar then. Yeah. Because the gates of hell prevailed against the church. And Martin Luther had to fix it. Oh, wait, no, John Calvin had to fix it. Oh, wait, no, Wesley had to fix it. Oh, wait, no, Joseph Smith had to fix it. <laughs> Zwingli, yeah, all those guys, yeah. Yeah, all of them. They, they all had to fix it, and there's no telling who got it right. So you but, could say the church has still been overcome because nobody knows who's right. <laughs> yeah, but they would say, they would say that they had to rebel because the church was keeping the Bible, the word of God, away from the people. Well, aside from the fact that that's blatantly false, <laughs> because, because the first thing that it's was printed was a belief. Bible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Aside from the fact that it's a lie on its face, okay, <laughs> that, that you know, the church always strove to reach the people and teach the people. That's what we had stained glass windows for, to teach the Gospels. You know, mm -hmm. if we were trying to hide the Gospels, we would do a very bad job, <laughs> okay, of hiding it. As, aside from that, though, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm coughing. <clears throat> aside from that, though, uh, oh, crap, I just lost my thought. <laughs> it went out of my head. That's okay. That's okay. No, no. We were. I was going to make know, another. I was going to make another point, but it went out of my head. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. No, you know, we we're just talking about the Catholic Church keeping the Bible, the word of God away from the people. And there's so many problems with this statement. Just historical nuances alone. Again, the printing machine, the illiter illiteracy rate, well, another one. And then the, the big one, why the church got upset and why the church in some cases had to lock it down is you were getting Protestant versions of the Bible that were full of errors, like Tyndale, full of errors. Yeah. And the church saw this and said, wait a minute, wait, wait. First of all, you don't have the right to interpret the Bible. Secondly, your, your Bible is full of errors. And yet Tyndale goes down as a hero and nobody wants to talk about the errors in the book, in the Bible version of Tyndale. Yeah, forget the fact that they took seven books out of the Bible. <laughs> yeah, that's true too, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they started distorting the scriptures. And we love the scriptures so much in the church that we protected it. Yeah, yeah. And, and so and so you got translations coming out. You know, it's funny because the translations are coming out in the vernacular 
right? They're coming out left and right by Protestants, and the church takes a slow approach with this because he understands the nuances of language, different cultures, how it's going to present the Bible, how it's going to turn it to make sure it's properly interpreted. Remember, we didn't have a printing press. These things were written out by hand for 1,600 years now. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and all of a sudden now you got a bunch of products that we got to get the word of God out in an attempt to divide the scripture from the church. And yet this is how the church governed itself. Right. And, and, and like you said, the stained glass, the statues, right. Uh, the Bible, the scriptures being read in mass every week. There's plenty of the Bible in the Catholic church. If the Catholic church was trying to keep the word of God away, why in the 16th century? Why didn't it start keeping it away in the 15th century? Yeah. Or the 12th, about, or the 10th, why the 16th I, century, Neil? I was about to say that. This is like, why for like, what, over a thousand years, the church yeah. is evangelizing. And then all of a sudden it said, oops, well, yeah, no, no, never mind. We're going to stop doing that. <laughs> yep, that's right. That's what's straight. It's a strange argument that's really, it feels like it's being pulled out of somebody's rear end in an attempt just to create a schism of sorts. It seems almost demonic to me in a sense, and I wouldn't doubt that was the case. And so so here we are 500 years after the fact, and we're seeing what Protestantism has devolved into. What, 30, 40,000 denominations now? Every single one of these uh, different denominations contradicting themselves on the essentials of the faith, except for this, did you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? No, my question is, did you accept him as your public Lord and Savior? That's the real mm -hmm. question here. Publicly, when you go receive the Eucharist, publicly, when you go to a priest to get confession, to get, you know, repentance, publicly, when we receive the, 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 the graces and, and the sacrament of, you know, First Communion, I mean, all these things are public events, marriage, all of it. But with Protestantism, you know, it becomes very secretive, it becomes very divisive, Neil, and at the end of the day, it really doesn't mean anything. Yeah, and, you know, they forget that part about the fact that Jesus in the scriptures tells us to take our problems to the church, to take our yeah, complaints sure. to the church. Okay. okay. And how the pillar and foundation of the, of the truth is the church. It's not the scriptures. It's the church. Okay. 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 But here's a challenge for Protestants. What's your definition of church? Because in the old Testament or in the new Testament, the time of Christ, it just meant a gathering of people. That's all church meant in the Bible. A, yeah, but here's the thing. What, that's a half-truth, by the way. It's a half-truth yeah. because it is a gathering of people, okay? But in Scripture, we are shown a hierarchy. Yes. Paul talks about uh, taking you to the ta – talks about the presbyterate and the episcopacy. He lays out an, a, a physical – uh, hierarchy of the church. <clears throat> he also points out that when you have a problem, you go to you, you go to your brother, and if your brother doesn't accept it, you take a witness, and if he doesn't accept them, then you take it to the church. That's not just a gathering of people. That's an authoritative body. That is a hierarchy he's talking about. You go to, and here's another thing too. When they bring that up, if the apostles were here right now, okay, would. Would they not accept the apostles as an authoritative body? Of course. They would say, well, the apostles are, you know, St. Peter, St. Paul, they have authority, and we're going to listen to what they say. Right. Well, right. it's the same thing, except for now we have successes of them. So they would accept their authority. Their authority has continued. Yeah, and I think the best example, of, this, of course, is in the book of Acts, where you really see the apostles acting like a, a magisterium already early on, right? Where mm -hmm. Peter is leading them, and Peter, ultimately, there's lots of debates, and whenever there's a confusion on a certain issue, the Bible uses language that then Peter spoke, and then the issue in the Bible was settled. You see early on, I believe when one of the apostles died, I believe the first successor was Matthias, I believe. I could be wrong on that. That's right, but Matthias, we he right. to, replace, to replace Judas. Right, that's right. That's right. To replace Jewish. Thank you. And, and so and here's, another, see, here's another thing. Um, the, the first council of the church happens in Scripture, the Council of Jerusalem. It does. That's right. Saint, it's St. Paul, after preaching for, uh, I forgot how long he was already preaching, decided to go back to Jerusalem to Peter and lay his teaching before the apostles in order to make sure that he was correct. That's a hierarchical body. That's, that's a right. church. That's right. No, now, what is interesting, Neil, is when I've talked to Protestants, 
One of the things they're trying to do is they're trying to go back to history of the early church, right? And they're trying to find Protestantism in the early church. And it's mm -hmm. fascinating because, you know, the different spins on history is really kind of the same thing you have with Sola Scriptura. It's, it's a matter of interpretation. Like I have one Protestant, um, you know, citing to me how, he, you know, how excited he was to read to read Saint Justin Martyr. And I'm like, <laughs> well, have you read, have you really read Saint Justin Martyr? I mean, the Catholic, it doesn't get more Catholic. The Catholic saint? About, huh? The Catholic saint, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Catholic saint, yeah. I mean, he believed in following your local bishop, not basement mm -hmm. Bible theology. He talked about the real presence of Christ. He talked about the regeneration, well, the real presence of the Eucharist. He talked about the regeneration of baptism here. Um, and, so, and so it's funny because these Protestants, oftentimes, they'll try to get deep into the early church fathers looking for a verification of their faith. And a lot of them will say, uh, you know, this council and this council and the council and this, and they'll quote the early councils. But obviously to them, something goes wrong later on where the ecumenical councils cease to exist. And my question to them is here, again, if we were having ecumenical councils, let's say in the first five centuries, why did the church, your church specifically, why do they stop having ecumenical councils here? Because as Catholics, we continue to have our councils. You know, it's like yeah. it's like something stopped, something vanished, and they're going back to history. They're reinterpreting with sort of biased eyes, right? And now they're trying to find a case for Protestantism when, in fact, when you look at the Church Fathers, how can you even doubt they were Catholic? And and how come those councils are authoritative until they they say something you don't like? See, that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> now, 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 all of a sudden, you're in charge. Yeah, that's right. You get to decide what's true. Once again, it's this personal relationship. I get to decide what's right and wrong. I get to decide what's true. Because, well, this council said this, and I don't like it. Yeah. And, and, so, how, do, and, and how do they get to decide which councils are authoritative and which ones are not? Yeah. Because in the church, we have a way of defining that. We we have certain councils that are infallibly defined and ones that are not. Right. They don't have that process. Yeah. Now, it's interesting. Some Protestants will tell you, Neil, that the Catholic Church is responsible for giving us the Bible. There's no way around it. I remember the Bible Answer Man used to make that argument before he became Orthodox, right? We got the Bible from the Catholic Church, essentially, or I guess he would argue now the Orthodox Church, right? And I've heard other. Yeah, well, my, my favorite thing is my favorite thing to say about Protestants is, listen, if you don't, if you're going to denounce the Church, the Catholic Church, then stop using our stuff, aka the right. Bible. <laughs> right, right, because we gave that the Bible as you know it now. You got from the Church, right? And see, and that's always been my comeback is because there's a lot of Protestants now that don't like being called Protestants. They'll tell you, we're not Protestants, we're Christians. And and, and my response to that is always, okay, listen, you're not allowed to redefine history because it accommodates you. If you're using the Catholic Bible, all right, as the word of God, that makes you, a, and you're not going to the Catholic Church, that makes you a de facto Protestant. History dictates that. You cannot relabel yourself because it's it's convenient for you. It's our stuff. Like you said, it's our Bible. It's a yeah. Catholic Bible. There's been, there were Catholics that suffered in great pain to pass that on to us through sacred tradition, or should I say through tradition, great hardships, struggles, sw sweat, tears, blood, all that stuff, Julian. And, and because now we live in modern times where we have the printing press or we can look it up on the internet, we just take that for granted. Yeah, and like the uh, how to be a Christian guy, you would say, yes, right. be Christian, drop the Protestantism. <laughs> <laughs> drop exactly. those Protestant teachings that you hold on to, and you'd be Christian. All right. Okay, well, I think we've hit the Protestants hard enough. And listen, you know, Neil, it's like I always say, we're not, I know there's many good Protestants out there that love Jesus, love Christ, and they're doing the best we can, especially in an apostatized world where the church has been maligned by the secular world and, and there's been a propaganda campaign against the church. Well, really since the Protestant Reformation, but that campaign to destroy the church has been really on steroids ever since the, the Enlightenment. And I understand Protestants are doing the best, especially if they've been born and raised in Protestant traditions and, and haven't had the proper exposure in that sense. And, and, and so, but, you know, as we kind of close this thing out here, we started with this thing of, you know, 
Uh, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? What I would say is it's a partial truth, but yep. there's more to it. Christianity is, is there's deeper elements to this. There's more that our Lord left us. And I think, you know, I think Protestants, if they want to be honest themselves, Neil, uh, need to be honest, you know, need to look into this a little bit more, right? Yeah, if you want to have a complete relationship with Jesus Christ, then you need to be in communion with him. That's as simple as mm -hmm. I can put it. If you're not in communion with Christ, mm -hmm. then your relationship is very, uh, what's the word? The way I want to put it politely, simple. Um, I want to say childish in a sense, because it's not mature. Right. Um, so if you want to mature that relationship, then you need to be in communion with Christ. And that is in his church. Yeah, I like that word you use, the, a complete relationship with Christ, a complete that really sums up, I think, what we Catholics are and believe. We have a complete relationship with Christ and not this superficial, you know, sort of emotional event, which is really an American phenomenon of Protestantism as it continues to mash up with sort of classical liberalism. And hence, here we got, you know, the health and wealth gospel, which is another mockery of Christianity in and of itself. Um, like I said, Protestantism in America to me has always been problematic. I, I've always found it kind of dubious in a way uh, because it's been mashed up again in this economic kind of system there's there's an incentive there uh to where religion can be used for you know nefarious ends i guess you could say there so so there you have it neil my friend um i want to thank you for joining my friend great conversation i'm sure we'll pick it up again my pleasure all right ladies and gentlemen this is frank signing off for the knights of christendom good night everybody <laughs>